Hello, and welcome to Mix Presents Sound for Film Award Season. I'm Clive Young, co-editor of Mix Magazine, and today we're chatting with the audio pros behind Netflix's new film, Maestro, which is in theaters right now and prepares, uh, premieres on Netflix December 20th. So joining us today are Tom Zanich, re-recording mixer, Steve, uh, Dean Zapancic, re-recording mixer, Steve Morrow, production sound mixer, and Jason Ruder. A supervising music editor. Now, the film traces the life of Leonard Bernstein, one of America's greatest composers, conductors, pianists, music educators, and about 20 other titles as well. It's a fascinating film that brings the man and his many varied works to life. Um, so with a film, however, like this, music isn't merely the focus or, or almost like another character. It's really an integral part of the main character, the, the music's drawn from across his career. So how early in the process did these choices come into it from, from how it was used to, or why it was used? Um, how early did these things come into play? And did any of that change along the way? There were some changes. I mean, Bradley's, you know, we, we started discussing the project about five years ago. Um, <clears throat> and he was already, at that time, we were still mixing Star is Born. He had some archival clips. Um, you know, Ely Cathedral and a couple others, the 73 performance. And uh, we started discussing kind of the methodology of how to how to shoot it back then when we were still on star. Um, Bradley definitely had a lot of, you know, the music in his head and in his mind at the scripting phase. So a lot of those choices were brought on by him very early on, you know, to different pieces he wanted to use. So it, it dates back quite a ways. And I'll say, well, we had a the library of, of those songs with us on set. And so even if a scene didn't have, you know, music in the image, we would play it out loud just to inform camera moves or dolly moves, things of that nature, so that the whole crew and cast kind of got the idea of what this music was going to be playing at this scene in the movie. The, the B side of that question, how did it change? The biggest change was that, uh, you know, early, like our first temp mix, um, we had all of the actual Bernstein, you know, recordings, um, which are, you know, awesome. They're great, but they're, you know, basically stereo things. And, and I think Jason, you had tried to find masters and multi tracks and stuff. And that just kind of didn't, didn't go anywhere. We weren't able to get stuff. So, after we, you know, the first temp mix, we had all this stereo stuff and um, tried to maximize that. And then we got to the Ely uh, Cathedral scene and that was recorded live. And so we had 5.1 stems of all of that. And, and it was like drastically more impactful um, just because of technology, you know. And so we then kind of all looked at each other and went, uh, yeah, I guess we got to re-record all this stuff. And, you know, Jason can go into the details of that. But that made a pretty major shift in that regard. How how far into the putting all this together does that come? Because that's a pretty major decision. Temp one or temp two. Yeah, it was, it was kind of early on in, in one of our first mixes. And we, you know, we looked, we, sh we shopped hard. I went, you know, we tried going to the Bernstein estate looking for multi-tracks for every performance, every piece of music. I think, you know, we chased down every single version and, and recording and history we could get our hands on. How many hours do you think you used on that? God, I don't know. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was tough with Brad. I mean, because Bradley was like, it, it's got to have the heartbeat of Lenny. And where's the magic? Is it is it in the conducting of of the of the archives, or is it? Um, can we be as ambitious enough to actually record that and get the you know the new audio technology on top of it, like in scoring and, and re-recording? So um, we weren't sure. I mean, it, it was kind of you know. Luckily, Yannick was able to help you know bring that initial like Lenny spirit to the equation in, in the recording sessions that we did. I got to ask Yannick is. Yannick was our, our conducting consultant throughout the process. Um, he, 
he's the most in, like incredible conductor I've ever witnessed. I mean, it, it was, you know, cause, cause Bradley was very sort of against click tracks, which made things sort of difficult to, you know, especially that far along in the process, it was like, well, Lenny didn't, didn't use clicks. We need to stay authentic. And, you know, it needs to be, the tempo needs to sort of come from the conductor, you know, really to help with the heartbeat of the whole story. And Yannick, I've never seen a human being like you could play him, you know, an old recording against picture. And like, he's got this amazing, like tempo memorization where he can really clock it. Uh, and we, we were able to turn it around and match it. You know, a lot of those nuances with the LSO. Yannick is what the New York Met conductor and Philly Phil. Yeah. He's the, Met. he was the Met. Now he was the Philly Phil several years ago when we engaged him. So the all of the music that we're listening to is is, is re-recorded. Is there any archival in there? There are a couple of uh, original archival tracks. Yeah, we spent a lot of the final dub. We we did a lot of a being back and forth, and and you know, to get the absolute best out of every scene. So the the fancy free we ended up using an original master. It just had a certain life to it that we just thought, um, it just it just paired with everything, you know, the, the, the Foley steps, the guys did, you know, all the movements and the dance, like it just, it just sat in the mix better. I think, I think as a whole, we all sort of agreed. So a couple spots we went back, but, um, you know, the, the majority ended up being the new recordings. The fancy free thing part certainly stands out with it, with all the choreography and the clapping and such. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great moment. Is, or is there any particular stories behind how that came together or, yeah, you know, I mean, is that strictly sort of manufactured after the fact? Is anything recorded on set and used on that? Or that one we played back. We did a lot. Steve and I both attended a lot of choreography rehearsals and played things back and got the timings down to the script. And we sort of came up with the edit. We combined, you know, it's one of the few places where we did edit Lenny's music, you know, to really get the timing out to the sequence and. Um, we'd hashed a lot of, of, uh, the timing out, um, through playback and, and choreography rehearsals and that sort of thing. But correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think in that we actually start with the, the original, you know, two track, uh, and then we transition into our re-recorded, you know, full, you know, multi-track you know new recording and it's a pretty seamless thing i mean it'd be tricky to to notice where that happens yeah these guys dean and richard did an incredible job helping you know create all those transitions that really sort of made the whole thing work we did do a full pass of them wearing earpieces all the dancers and dancing and recording their footsteps not sure if it made it to you guys you know because sometimes that gets lost in the edit but um i don't know i don't know if that made it or not but we tried to do a pass because we knew it was real specific to that stage just to get them dancing and making the movements. And We didn't use a lot of Foley or the production stuff. It, Bradley was pretty specific on uh, what he wanted to hear and uh, what dancers he need, wanted to hear. So, uh, yeah, it's a uh, try. We tried different things. It went through various incarnations where there was all of it in there and then it was like, okay, let's take this out. Let's play this. And so it was, again, you know, we go over this movie with a fine tooth comb and really like every single little thing is decided. And what production you did have versus full on any of the stuff from Foley or whatever, uh, they transitioned really well together. Richard, the Foley uh, walkers that Richard hired, they it was all recorded in a practical house that's their setup and uh so it it tied in with production pretty seamless actually there's some spots where production didn't pick up steps but the quality of those steps were really great and character wise so if you if you listen to my stem my foley stem and i actually did a little so we had a tour of SC students, and I said, "You want to see what this is all about?" And so, your your production, and then the production feet go away, like three steps, and then 
So I'm in, out, in, out, in, out on a couple of scenes, but you could never, you will never be able to hear it. It was really, that's the fun stuff too. Obviously the, the, the music is a, is a primal, you know, a, a real thick main part of this, but, but is aside from the music, is there a, how would you describe the the overall tone of this film outside of the music? I mean, is there anything that you were aiming to to achieve? Yeah, I think it's it's you know even though there's a lot that's not music, it is all musical. I mean, that was um, you know one of the things that we all talked about ahead of time was that you know it's it's a it's kind of like the movie is a symphony. The movie. Um, has this ebb and flow to it that that is rhythmic and that is kind of um you know almost choreographed in a way to flow and and so it it you know it seamlessly like you know the two pot- potentially like the two most jarring transitions visually in the film are when we go from color to black and white in the beginning and then in the middle of the movie we go from black and white to color and sound wise, those are both absolutely smooth. Um, And they transition in a way that, you know, when, when I've talked to people who've seen the movie, they're like, yeah, I didn't even notice that it went to color until it was playing for a little while. And I realized it was in color. Um, But there's lots of transitions like that in the movie where it just kind of like, you know, there's a handoff a, a, and a grace to one scene into the next and, and different elements into each other. There are some deliberately very abrupt, you know, scene changes also. Uh, and there's, you know, a meaning to that. Um, but they're even more powerful because we hardly ever do it. And certainly there's some points where, the, I mean, for instance, there there was a there's some points where the music, I guess, is not quite a counterpoint, but you wouldn't necessarily expect it to work, and yet it does. The, the part that I I wind up thinking of is um, there's a scene in their backyard, and there's this very swanky jazz playing, and I it's not really what you would picture for a family having fun in the backyard, but it works in this, and it feeds into the next scene, like you were saying, uh, which which is a a whole bunch of people slow dancing together and such. Um, okay. So let, let me roll down here. Um, so, so Tom and Dean, I mean, what, what did you start getting, uh, from the different editorial teams? I mean, did, did were you getting stems? Were you getting on individual tracks? Uh, so you could, when you start building things together, or what, what were you looking at in, in terms of starting to put all this together? On my end, you know, I'm handling the dialogue and the music. And so I basically am getting um, a bunch of tracks that, uh, you know, what Steve recorded out in production goes through. um, Tony Martinez was our um, dialogue supervisor. And so he would then, you know, assemble that. He would go kind of do an editorial cleanup pass and kind of, you know, remove you know whether there's some clicks or whatever that might be extraneous in something and um and kind of just you know cut for what you know the picture cut has done and and then present me with kind of the different mics that um might be there and they're they're all kind of lined up and in phase with each other so that i can use them and pick and choose from them um and then there's also some there's there's basically only three s- small lines of ADR in this whole movie, um, so it's almost all production. Um, there is a, a bunch of group ADR um, for just kind of crowds and and you know little call outs from the the crowds you know yelling bravo or whatever. Um, and um and then on the music side you know jason would would uh assemble you know all of the multi-tracked uh you know basically it's all been sort of stemmed out into 5.1 stems all of the material that got recorded you know at air studios 
um, in there's maybe, I think there was 16 to 20 5.1 stems, um, you know, and then, um, I would mix that into Atmos. We also have, you know, a few places where there's source music and, and those are just stereo, you know, needle dot needle drop type tracks. And, and so those then have to get processed to sound like they're coming out of whatever, like, you know, they play a record and it has to sound like it's coming from there. Um, so that's kind of my end. And then Dean's got everything else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Basically like any other movie, I've got the backgrounds and we'll pre-dub those with backgrounds will consist of airs, interior airs, exterior airs, winds, birds. This movie uh background wise bradley was pretty specific there's a, a a wind motif that goes throughout the movie and pretty specific on what the character of the wind at what point and how much tree movement is needs to be played and you know some leaves and we, we went through a lot of dances with winds which was another title of a movie. Um, but, uh, and Richard did a great job selecting uh, material that Bradley uh, could pick and choose from. And then we had Foley, which was great. I love the Foley in this movie. And then the, all the period cards and whatnot. But uh, it was great because we're spanning 50 years. So on a sound effects side, you know, Richard did a fantastic job, he and his guys, to going to picking the right sounds for the for each era and it was fun to mix that kind of stuff and what was fun is we're in atmos but the aspect ratio is is not widescreen so it gave us some it, we couldn't take you out of the movie but it was still everything is still being played in in today's format very, um, I, I have to ask, I mean, I was surprised at how many country scenes there were, for instance. I kind of pictured this would be all New York City apartments and, and concert halls, but there, there's quite a, a lot in nature, whether it's, you know, I, I guess the suburbs of, of Connecticut or Tanglewood and, and also the middle of Central Park. Is, is there a difference between the, the countryside of Central Park and, the, the, and uh, Connecticut, would you say? Well, you know what? Or, or that's what you're good, trying to achieve? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. And we did go through great pains to make sure that if like the, the central park uh, is we couldn't be what new york is today so we had to play kind of use our imaginations and yeah new york was busy but the, like the walk through central park there are cars but there's wind and there you know there's birds and whatnot but it still sounds like the city and then when bradley was very specific how each how Tanglewood needed to feel and sound versus how Connecticut sounded and Connecticut had to be peaceful and, uh, you know, uh, very calm. That's what, that's where he went to, you know, create and versus then Tanglewood had a whole nother Massachusetts had a whole nother feel to it. There's of course different, different types of birds depending on the sort of moods and the, you know, different birds played, you know, for uh, kind of when they were happy and together and when there was tension between them, it'd be a different, different things that play, you know. That was fun that, because then you're kind of getting into the psychology, you know, without hitting people over the head. One of the high points of the film, obviously, is uh, the, the scene where he's conducting at Ely Cathedral. I mean, it's, it's such a showstopper, not only in terms of the significance of the story but also i mean it's it, it's i mean visually it has a lot of grandeur and emotional heft but but likewise with, with the sound i mean a lot of the film really hinges on, on this scene so i was wondering if you guys could all individually tell me about how you approached what you did for this this real i mean it's not quite a climactic moment but it is it's a big one it was a beast i mean we you know i'd studied the the humphrey burton archives quite a bit and i'd read you know, um, sort of the horror stories they had making that, you know, back then. I know initially there were there were takes. They had a bat problem in, in the tower where it botched a lot of recordings. 
Um, there was a crane that fell over. They they done um, they actually did reshoots on on the performance in seventy three, um, and everything I could find on Ely was not super optimistic about being easy to mic or record in. I mean, the reverb is just so excessive. Um, and we, knowing that Bradley wanted a camera, a cable cam and, and everything, it was like, okay, this is really going to be challenging. Um, how we're actually going to get a, a good orchestral recording. I mean, there were, there were certain places we could hide a few spot mics, but it, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't, as much coverage as we would normally do on a recording like that in a modern scoring session. So, you know, we were, we were looking at miking it like an old classical performance. Um, we, we, we went to put uh, like an orchestral tree up in the front, like we, like we normally would. And I remember telling him, we'll paint it out, you know, we'll come up with a VFX budget. And he's just like, no, get rid of it. So then it became, you know, like every step of the way, there was like another challenge. So we had to go higher and higher with the microphones. And I'm thinking, this is really going to be tough. Um, but we we were able to get a couple period mics in frame, which helped with with the chorus and especially. Um, and we we got we just got great coverage. I mean, we got really good coverage that day. The idea was that we should record it live, the performance live, not not to a playback or to a, a click track or anything like that and fake it, you know, cause Bradley's um, feeling from stars born is that that felt real to the audience and let's recreate that on this film, but only with an orchestra. And that's, I think when Jason and I, you know, went out drinking and never stopped <laughs> for three years, but. Jason and I kept trying to talk and we're like, okay, what if we play back the strings and we just do the chorus and the, and the soloist live and Bradley's like, nope. Yeah, it would be like we would try here and there, like, well, what if we do it instead this way? You know, but it was always it always came back to like, no, we, we got to do this live. You guys got this. You got this. Yeah. What if we did three times? And Jason and I were looking at each other and go, yeah, and walk away. And that would be, and then we'd come up with some sort of, you know, plan 42. I mean, I always had like my third heart attack when the, when the chorus showed up on the day because they were, um, they were just at, they were like, we need a rehearsal to, to get used to the reverb time in this room or we're never going to be able to to clock to the orchestra and uh we didn't have the time we had to skip it the, the chorus was not thrilled well there was also a lot of like you know the, there's issues with a modern uh orchestra that you don't have with the period orchestra the period orchestra sat close together and the modern orchestra doesn't you know doesn't allow the brass section to blow out the you know the the people in front of them they you know they put up plastic shields between them they separate them uh and these are all things that you know we had to be careful of because you don't want to, you know, damage these professionals hearing, but it also has to look right and has to be in the right direction. So, you know, the LSO to their credit took a lot of, um, you know, took a lot of care for their players and, and put, you know, decibel readers under people's chairs. And, you know, after every, every take we, they would go down, download the, the thing and say, okay, the, the, this section needs a 20 minute break because, that went over the, you know, the decibel reading or whatever it was. And so you'd give a break. And um, so there was a lot of that kind of behind the scenes, like, oh, well, we can't really just, and, and we also knew, I mean, Jason and I knew, well, we're not going to be playing this, you know, for eight hours straight with these guys. It's never going to, it's never going to happen. So you get a couple takes, you know, and then everybody needs a break because it's just, a, it's a heavy piece. So there's a lot, there's a lot that went into that. Mahler's second symphony this is the most rewarding piece for a conductor to conduct. And also one of the most difficult. Because there's so many people. We can see it in the cathedral. You know, you get a hundred piece chorus, more than a hundred musicians playing, various instruments and organs. It's very complex. It requires years of experience or also being fearless. Bradley, when he told me he wanted to conduct this, I understood completely, but he prepared not for weeks, months, he prepared for years for that moment. It's really quite something to watch. I mean, so I, I, I presume it, there's a couple of shots, which I, I think in fact are in the section of the clip where the the violins are, it's, it's almost like watching water boil. They're, they're so, and now I, I presume that's the actual LSO. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then we had a quick chat with them and, and they were just able to cheat the violin section up. So that the LSO was great to just sort of, you know, help with camera moves and, and 
take those sort of quick notes on the fly. So this stuff then gets sent over to to you guys. Right? How how do you approach making giving this the impact that that so clearly is going on in, in person? So I get all these tracks that they've recorded, and again, it's all split out into wide stems and. Um, you know, and then I'm mixing in Atmos. And so, um, you know, this piece, you know, it builds and builds and builds. And then when you think it's at the top, it keeps going, uh, which is one of the really cool things about it. And so the trick was, you know, I guess there's a couple of different things. One is as we're, as we're moving, you know, cause the camera in this big oneer that's most of the the scene um, moves over, you know, the orchestra and comes brown and back and, you know, eventually lands on Felicia. But as we're sort of focusing visually, as we're watching the different things, you know, we want to be able to, to hear what we're looking at. And, and yet we don't want you to ever think that we're like, Oh, we're playing. Oh, here's now this instrument and then there's that instrument and bopping around it needs to be a completely you know seamless you know thing that that uh, you would never think we're trying to do something like that and so there are very subtle moves and little tweaks to try to happen to shift the focus here or there get this timpani to pop out just a little bit that as you kind of notice the timpani player your brain like dials in to the timpani and go, Oh, but it's not, you know, um, it's not obnoxious and it's not sticking out weird. So thank you all for, for, for chatting with us. I, I want to thank our panelists for, for taking time out to, to speak with us at, at today's event. I want to thank Netflix. And of course, thank you to everybody watching as a reminder is short list voting begins on December 14th and ends on December 18th. So please go out and vote. And in the meantime, sit tight. And we'll be back with more Mix Presents Sound for Film award season.